In this video, I'm going to discuss interpreting food webs and a little bit more information on ecological pyramids. I want to start by talking about food chains because you probably were introduced to food chains earlier on in your science studies. A food chain only shows one energy transfer path, one way that energy moves through an ecosystem. And if you're looking at a food chain, you notice there's an arrow, and the arrow is going to point in the direction of the energy flow. It's pointing at who's doing the eating. So in a food chain, you start with a producer, you start with where that energy is coming in and being transferred from light energy into chemical energy, and in this case, we've got corn or maize, and it will be eaten by something. So we have a grasshopper or a locust eating that corn, and then that grasshopper is being eaten by a lizard, and the lizard being eaten by the snake. So here's an example of a food chain, how energy is moving from the corn to the grasshopper to the lizard, and eventually to the snake. The feeding position in the food chain, whether it's the first level of the producer or if it's one of the consumers, this is known as the trophic level. Trophic refers to feeding. If you remember, autotroph is something that self-feeds, uh, can produce its own food source. And all food chains are going to have at least two trophic levels. It's at least going to be a producer plus the consumer that is eating that producer. But we can be a little more specific on our consumers. Of course, our food chains are always going to start with the producer. And then the primary consumer is the organism that eats the producer. So it is one arrow away from the producer. Then the consumer that eats those primary consumers, or in our previous example, the lizard that ate the grasshopper, that's the secondary consumer. So it's two arrows away from the producers. Then if we move up to the third level, it's labeled as a tertiary consumer. That's another way of saying third. And fourth level, another word you're probably not familiar with, but quaternary consumers are the fourth level. The tertiary and quaternary consumers are typically the top predators in a food chain. They're, one, they're organisms that are not regularly eaten by other consumers for food, though in the case of an injured or an old um, organism, they may actually be eaten by something else, but generally these are our top predators. Food chains, of course, are always going to include decomposers, but they're usually not shown, and decomposers can come in on any level because if something dies that's a primary consumer, it will be decomposed, and so those decomposers will be on that secondary level. If it's a quaternary consumer that dies, your decomposers come in again, so decomposers are usually left out. So a food web is putting together many food chains to show us multiple energy paths through an ecosystem. It's important to note that the same consumer can occupy different trophic levels in a food web depending on the food source that's being considered. So to label this food web, we've got two producers down here on the bottom, marsh, grass, and cattail, and then those will be eaten by your primary consumers. We'll just put a little one here by our crickets and the grasshoppers, they, is, they are eating the producer directly. And then those organisms are being eaten by something out, else. And so the shrew is a secondary consumer as is the frog. And then your secondary consumers, whatever eats them is gonna be a tertiary consumer. So we have the snake on the third level and the hawk but because we also have this arrow going from the snake to the hawk, in this case the hawk also is a quaternary consumer if it eats the snake. Doing the same thing with an aquatic ecosystem, we have a type of microscopic algae, the primary producer in the aquatic system, a phytoplankton, and also we have some algae over here, some larger um, algae bladder wreck, this is what we call seaweed. Your primary consumers would be the things that ate those producers directly. So we have a sea urchin and a limpet and a flat winkle and a gray mullet, all being directly one arrow from the producer to those organisms. And then the organisms that eat those primary consumers are our secondary consumers. So here the seal is a secondary consumer, as in the crab and the lobster and the seagull. 
And then the tertiary consumers would be eating the secondary consumers. So we see that the seagull also is a, terti or is a tertiary consumer when it eats the crab. The, the seal can also be a tertiary consumer when it eats the lobster. So again, one organism can occupy several trophic levels depending upon what they're eating. Now, food webs, even though they're more complex than food chains, still are simplified versions of ecological relationships. They're just giving the big picture of how energy flows through an ecosystem, helps us determine maybe what key organisms are so that we can uh, predict the impact of losing those organisms on the whole food web system in that ecosystem. Now, even though we're talking about consumers. We've before talked about how the consumers can be carnivores that are only eating meat. They can be omnivores that eat meat and or eat other organisms and producers. They can be scavengers that go after animals that have already died. But many consumers really are omnivores and so they will occupy different levels in the food webs. If they produce, if they dine on a producer, they are being a <clears throat> being an herbivore at that moment, but overall they're an omnivore because they also will eat other organisms directly as a carnivore might. Now, ecological pyramids are used to illustrate three different aspects of ecosystems. They can be used to show the energy transfer from one trophic level to another, so they, they tend to be called energy pyramids. Or the, ener the ecological pyramid could show the biomass of the organisms at, at each trophic level, how much of that energy is being used to build the organism to be put into the cells and make the organism larger. Or pyramids also show population numbers for each trophic level, how many organisms of that particular um, level, primary consumer, secondary consumer, whatever, is found. So each type of pyramid is used to illustrate different relationships between the organisms in an ecosystem and can help us understand what is happening in that ecosystem as energy flows through it. So to look at each of them, I mentioned the energy pyramid already in the previous video, but your energy pyramid is showing the amount of energy passing through each trophic level over a particular period of time. So if you look at this energy pyramid here, we're giving data that it is per year. So if we look at our primary producers, you know, they are they are producing or they are taking in 9,000 kilocalories per square meter per year. As the sun comes in, it transferred into chemical energy by photosynthesis. And then the amount, about 90% of that energy is actually used by the organism for sustaining its own life processes, for building and repairing cells, for growth. Only 10% is put into storage and that 10% that is what is available to be passed along to whatever eats that organism. So out of those 9,000 kilocalories, only 900 are available moving up to the primary consumer level. And again, 90% of that is used to sustain life in those organisms. And so only 900 kilocalories are available to be passed on to our secondary consumers. And then we get to our tertiary consumer and only 9 kilocalories per square meter per year. So as we move up an energy pyramid, we see that less energy is available in an ecosystem as trophic levels increase. Without our producers down here on the bottom, without enough producers to kind of bring energy into the system, the amount that's going to be available at the top level is going to be very small. The second type of ecological pyramid is a biomass period pyramid, which shows the amount of energy that's converted to biomass at each trophic level. Biomass is a little more flexible than energy periods because our levels might change with the seasons in certain ecosystems. When we have like the um, deciduous forest, things in our forest system, the primary producers basically shut down in cold weather, and so the shape of the pyramid will change. In addition, aquatic ecosystems often have an inverted shape because the lifespan of the producers at the upper levels is much longer than the lower level. And so in here, we're looking at the energy converted to biomass before an organism is eaten. If you have a lot of small organisms on the producer level that are, have a very short lifespan, you tend to create an inverted pyramid. So I just have two examples here, sort of your typical terrestrial ecosystem based on grasses, you know, many, many grasses in a prairie, for example. Many plants, many individual grass plants are feeding <clears throat> a smaller number of grasshoppers, and they are able to produce, you know, a certain amount of biomass, and then the biomass is transferred onto mice, and then finally to snakes. So as we move up the 
biomass period pyramid, it looks very similar to our energy pyramid, that there's less energy being converted to biomass because of the lifespan of all of these organisms. In the aquatic ecosystem, we see a slightly inverted or sort of a diamond-shaped pyramid because the phytoplankton, the producers in this system, as I said, are very small and have short lifespans. So the amount of energy that's converted to biomass for those individual organisms is much smaller than that of the small organisms that eat the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, which will live longer and are larger. And then finally, a pyramid of numbers shows the number of organisms at each trophic level. And these can have a variety of shapes depending upon the size of the ecosystem that's being studied. So again, our typical kind of prairie <clears throat> grassland scenario, we've got a, a normally shaped pyramid with a wide base of your producers of grass, and then we move up to herbivore snails and then to a carnivore of mice. And so that looks more like a pyramid. But if we have a pyramid that has, based on what's on a tree, you have one, very large, but one large producer that is going to be feeding a number of caterpillars that then would be eaten by a bird. That's what a blue tit is. And then with a parasite that is feeding on a, um, again here, a producer, that we have one rose bush. That we have aphids feeding on that rose bush, but then there are parasites on the aphids, and so the numbers in this particular ecosystem are favoring the parasite as compared to the rose bush. So the pyramid of numbers just gives you another way of looking at how many organisms are present, how many organisms can be sustained by the previous trophic level, and just helps you get an idea about what's happening inside that ecosystem. So we use all this information, the food webs and the different types of ecological pyramids, really to understand the interrelationships between the different organisms, the different ways that energy is passing through that particular ecosystem, so we have a better understanding how energy and matter are flowing from one organism to another.